Good morning. This is John Hesse, Cahoka Presbyterian Church. I'm thankful to have you following along on, in the scriptures. Today we'll be reading from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. And the title of the message is Judgment and Deliverance, Part 2. Um, <clears throat> this is part of a, a longer passage, actually. There's several verses here that are all one, one sentence. Um, if I would have written this sentence, of, of course... I'm not inspired by the Word of God. But if I would have, would have written this sentence in, a, in a, an English class, I probably would have gotten some marks off for a long run-on sentence. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, there's a great deal of power in what Peter has to write, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, before we read the Word, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask that you would search our hearts. We ask that you would cleanse our hearts by your word that you would help us to see things as you see them not as we either we hope they were or as we fear they are but in light of your judgment we ask for your work in us to strengthen us in you in jesus name amen second peter 2 verses 4 through 7 for if god did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who is oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Okay, starting on verse 5, uh, we're, we're continuing from where we were last week. And did not spare the ancient world. The, the, the world is the, the uh, Greek word cosmos, but in the English sense, we tend to think of cosmos as referring to the, the stars, the, the, the nighttime sky, the constellations, the things we see around us. Uh, the Greek word cosmos refers to humanity as a whole. Uh, past, present, and future, just all of humanity in, in a collective sense. Um, <clears throat> and there's a couple of scriptures I'd like to refer to you concerning that. One is Hebrews 11, verse 7, but I would like to read from 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot in these two verses. Uh, John writes first, these, these things I write to you that you may not sin. These, these things are written to us as a guard against getting deceived and getting caught up by sin. And yet, he's very, very realistic. And if anyone sins, which we all do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. God has given us his word to give us the instruction that we can, we can use and he desires us to use, and as we grow in the faith, we should increase, uh, and as, as one, one uh, <clears throat> person, and I don't know who originated this saying, but I, I, think, it's, I think it's wise in a uh, kind of a casual sort of a way that a Christian is never sinless, but as he or she grows in faith, they should sin less. That should characterize our lives is, is a decreasing frequency um, of those things that we are all prone to. And then in verse 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Now, there's a word you don't hear every day, propitiation. As a matter of fact, you probably don't hear it all unless you're in a, some sort of a religious setting, a, a church, or talking to somebody. And what in the world does propitiation mean? Well, 
There, there's not really any any other word that's a uh, that's an adequate substitute <laughs> that's in common usage. But propitiation means the legal payment made for a debt that is owed, a, a, a debt that has been legally incurred. So that, for instance, um, if I had uh, if, if I was driving too fast and and distracted and and I <clears throat> happened to uh, to hit a mailbox well the propitiation would be the cost of replacing that mailbox and and that is something I could pay same scene same driver driving too fast driving distracted and instead of a mailbox I hit a child well, if the child is injured but recovers, I could at least theoretically pay for their medical care. What if the child is killed? There is nothing that I can do to pay for that loss. And, <clears throat> and the appropriation that's spoken here is, is that we have all offended a holy God with, with a debt we cannot pay. We simply cannot pay. But Jesus is our appropriation. He is the one who paid that legal penalty that every single one of us owes. Um, and, and so it's, it's a single word that covers a fairly complex um, concept. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only. It's not like we can say, well, we're the only ones God loved enough to care, to, cared enough to die for. No, but also for the whole world. There's that word, world, cosmos the collective term of all humanity, that Jesus' death was on behalf, not just of us, but of, of all, and specifically of all who would, who would uh, trust in him. Okay, back to 2 Peter 2. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah. Um <clears throat> If you're not familiar with the story of Noah, I would refer you to Genesis, the first book in the Bible, chapters 6 through 8, which we're not going to read. Um, if you're not familiar with the story of Noah, I, I really encourage you to read it. Um, for those of us who grew up in around churches or read Bible story books or had them read to us, we're at least somewhat familiar with the story of who Noah was and what happened to him. But save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, that Noah was someone whose, whose very life and whose testimony was a warning to the world of his time of judgment to come, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Uh, most scholars think that Noah was 120 years in building the ark, 120 years in which those who saw him at work had opportunity to take advantage of the mercy that God was offering to them and chose to ignore it. Going on to verse 7. Oh, ungodly, sorry. Bringing in a flood on the world of the ungodly. Now, ungodly literally means without worship. And I think that's interesting because we can get... Uh, we can get a false idea of what belief is. And an un ungodly person is not only somebody who says, well, I don't think there is a God. Most people believe there's some kind of a God, even if they believe that God is them. Uh, but most people believe in some kind of a God, believe that there is a God or gods or some impersonal force or some combination of deities of some type, something that brought this universe into existence. Most people believe that. Uh, the complexity of the universe itself makes it very difficult to believe that it happened by chance. Um, even those who claim that they believe it happened by chance, in most cases, that is a response not out of, uh, of studying it, but out of some deep... Uh, trauma that they have suffered physically or emotionally that they, they blame on, on God or what they perceive as God. But it, it means literally without worship. 
not those, um, so this person who can say there's a God, this person can say that Jesus is the Son of God. This person can say that Jesus is the Savior of the world who came to bear our sins and yet not worship. So this is referring specifically to those who don't worship. As a matter of fact, those three things. You know, there is a God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus came and died in our place to save us from our sins. Demons would agree with those three things. They don't embrace any one of them, but they would agree with them. They know they're true, and they tremble with fear. Um, so we can assent to something without believing in it. Uh, so ungodly, those who are without worship. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. Paul is encouraging his young protege, Timothy. This is the last writing of Paul. Paul knows that he is probably soon going to be executed, and so he wants to make sure that Timothy is encouraged. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for per liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. In this list, God is showing how important it is for us to have a heart of worship, not just intellectual assent. Jude 4 and 14 and 15 all speak <coughs> warnings to those who live without worshiping God. They, they may say there's a God, but they live without any um, surrender to his will. Um, it's easy to say there is a God. It's a lot harder to live as though there is a God and he will someday judge me and everything that I think, say, and do, I will give an account for. Okay, verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction. Sodom and Gomorrah, <clears throat> again, Genesis 19, verses 1 through 27, get the context of that. And in verses 24 and 25, you see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as fire from heaven rains down upon them. Now, I would like to, and, and probably, again, most of us who have had any sort of uh, background in the Bible or Bible stories uh, are at least fairly familiar with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, although, I, I would encourage you if you're not, or if you want to refresh yourself in it, to read Genesis 19, 1 through 27. But Deuteronomy 29, 22 through 27 shows that hundreds of years later, God uses Sodom and Gomorrah as an example as a warning to hold fast to his ways. Deuteronomy 29, verses 22 through 27. So that the coming generation of your children who rise up after you, this is speaking of uh, the dangers that will follow up on the children of Israel if they refuse to obey his law. And the foreigner who comes from a far land when they would say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses, which the Lord has laid on it. The whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. All the nations would say, Why has the Lord done so to this land? What does the heat of this great anger mean? Then the people would say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods that they did not know and that he had not given to them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against this land to bring upon it every curse that is written in this book. So as you read Deuteronomy, 
And it's not exactly a light and easy read, but interestingly enough, Deuteronomy, because it's the giving of the law the second time when the children of Israel are getting ready to enter into the promised land. But interestingly enough, when Jesus was being tempted, every quotation he gave was from the book of Deuteronomy. It wasn't from Psalms. It wasn't from Proverbs. Nothing wrong with those books, obviously, but he quoted from Deuteronomy, the book of the giving of the law. Um, <clears throat> and so even though it, it can be pretty dry to a modern reader, he intended for us to, uh, to heed it and pay attention to it. Jude 7 is a parallel passage warning of the destruction that Sodom and Gomorrah faced as their refusal to submit to the will of God and as their continued worshiping of other gods. Condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Again, that word ungodly, living without worship. Verse 7, and delivered righteous lot. <clears throat> and again, going back to Genesis 19. If you're familiar with the story, if, if not, I encourage you to. To deliver means to draw out or, lit, or to drag along the ground. And if you read in Genesis 19, the angel of the Lord almost had to drag Lot along the ground with his family to get them out of the city that he was getting ready to destroy. He had to take them by the hand and pull them out of the city. They, they lingered so long, wanting to stay, wanting, not wanting to leave their homes. <clears throat> there are some, some other fairly well-known scriptures that use this passage. Probably one, one that's really well-known to most of us is... Matthew 6, 13, and Luke 11, 4. It's in the Lord's Prayer where he teaches us to pray in this sense, deliver us from evil, to drag us along if necessary from the grip that evil has in our lives. He loves us enough to do that. Um, and, I mean, you could compare it to the image of, of, a, uh, of a loving parent or a loving sibling, or a stranger who cares about somebody else who goes into a burning building and drags people out. He is delivering them. God loves us enough to deliver us from evil. Luke 1, 71 through 74, you have the prophecy given by Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, concerning his son, and he speaks of John as one pointing to deliverance. Luke 1, 71 through 74. And this passage starts at verse 67, where his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And then I'm going to jump to 71. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy perform, promised to our fathers. And to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our lives. And everyone that God has called to himself, he has delivered us from the hand of our enemies. He has delivered us from the enemy within. He's delivered us from our enemies without. He's delivered us from the sin nature that we have, that we've had in our own lives, that the, the uh, desire to follow our own path that's leading us to destruction. And he's delivered us from enemies without, those um, demonic powers that would try to draw us back into addictions and habits of sin that... Um, that lead to corruption. I mean, this, this scripture speaks of Lot, and, and we'll get more to that later, but he delivers us for that purpose. Romans 7, 18 through 25, speaking of the deliverance of God. And this is in the midst of Paul is writing about recognizing the struggling that he has with his sin nature. 
if we're if we're honest with ourselves as believers, we can recognize his words. Romans seven eighteen through twenty five. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in my old nature, nothing good dwells. For the will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it. The sins that dwells in me. I find a law then that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, if, if Paul would have ended there, this would have been a very hopeless passage of Scripture because he's describing a struggle that he can't win, that he doesn't have the strength to win. But at verse 25, I thank God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh the law of sin. So that the, the battlefield is the mind. And that we will. Uh, and Paul seems to be indicating that we will struggle. With the flesh nature for as long as we draw breath on this planet. But that <clears throat> as we grow in righteousness. As we grow in God. We'll walk in victory more and more. Second Corinthians 1, verses 9 and 10. Second Corinthians 1, verses 9 and 10. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. Paul is sharing the, the great confidence that he has, not in himself, but in God, the same confidence that we can have. If our confidence was, in our, was within ourselves, then we wouldn't have much reason for confidence because there's always somebody that's stronger. There's always somebody that's smarter. There's always somebody who has more abilities. Um, but our confidence is not in ourselves. Our confidence is in our Heavenly Father. Colossians 1, 12 through 14 also speaks of that deliverance. I'd like to read from 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. For they themselves, they, speaking of, of those <clears throat> from, a previ from previous churches, Macedonia and Achaia, who had heard Paul speak and had known his witness, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how you turned from God, from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us, from the wrath to come. In 2 Peter 4, 7, or no, 2, 2 Timothy 4, sorry, 2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18. But the Lord stood with me, this is Paul speaking, and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, back to Second Peter 2, verse 6. And delivered righteous lot. Now, if you read Genesis 19 and, and the, the previous few chapters, it's really hard to see Lot's is very righteous and from human standpoints he really wasn't but he still had faith in God uh, Lot is is an, is an example and, and a very sad example of the extremely destructive nature of 
being a believer in God, but living not by the power of God, but living according to the wisdom of the world. Because Lot did escape the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but what did it cost Lot? It cost him his wife. It cost him his children. It cost him everything that he had built in those cities. He went to speak to his sons-in-law to warn them of the destruction that was to come. And they had seen so little of the work of God in his life that when he spoke to them, he seemed to, they thought he was joking. Um, so the cost that Lot paid for his compromise was enormous. Now Lot is listed in in uh, in Second Peter um, here that we just read. He's also listed in Hebrews 11 as one of those who was justified by faith, one of those who was saved by his faith in God. So he did receive that salvation, and yet because he lived that that life of compromise, he lost the ability to influence those around him toward that same righteousness. And that had to be, I, I can't imagine anything more sad as, as for any father, for any grandfather, for anyone who recognizes that they have people watching them to realize that you know, if I've made choices that are based on my selfish desires, as Lot did, you know, hey, that's a great place to raise a family. I can make a lot of money there. The grass is green. I can raise large crops. That's a great place. And, uh, you know, maybe I could be an influence for good there. Well, Lot, unfortunately, was not an influence for good there. But it was a place where his entire family became corrupted. And he, he wound up losing all of his family as a result of it. Um, and, and Lot serves as a, 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 a testimony of God's ability to save those who trust in him despite their failures. And Lot also serves as a solemn warning against taking that salvation lightly and casually, but to cling fast to him. Okay, reading on. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. <clears throat> now, the word that's translated oppressed is in the New King James, which is what I'm reading from, is translated vexed um, in the King James. And it, it's a word that means uh, to, to oppress can mean something that's a, a single action that's dramatic. But the, the word that's translated oppressed or vexed in the King James means to, uh, to irritate by constant friction. Just like, and I've, had, I've this, had this happen to me in woodworking. If you accidentally touch the uh, sanding belt of a, of a uh, belt sander, uh, it's very irritating. <laughs> and it'll remove skin. It's not a good time. Um, now, suppose you were to slow that process down and, and you were doing something and you constantly rub against something that's rough. Well, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a blister. The second thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a callus. And both of those things happened to Lot. His heart became calloused. He was no longer able to be effective for God because his heart had become calloused toward the things of God. He had been rubbed by what he saw around him. The word that's translated filthy, he was oppressed, he was vexed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. It literally means without restraint. It goes beyond that which has some sort of a limitations to that which is out without restraint. Um, It's, it's the difference between um, somebody, you know, robbing is robbing. Stealing from someone is stealing from someone. And they're, and they're, both, they're, they're both taking something that is not ours. It's the difference between somebody who thinks, well, 
I will only rob from those who can afford it. And they might justify it by saying, oh, I'll help somebody who can't afford it with some of that, the, the Robin Hood syndrome. Um, and the, the person whose robbery is without restraint, I'll, I'll take anything from anybody that I want. Um, they're both robbing, but one is without restraint. There's no moral stopping. Uh, Lot was oppressed by those who were living without any restraint whatsoever. Romans 13, 11 through 14. I'd like to read from Romans 13, 11 through 14. And do this, knowing the time, that it is high time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh, to fulfill its loss. As someone has, has uh, wisely said, sin never, never comes to us. Satan never comes to us and tells us how far down the road what he's offering us will take us. He doesn't. You know, I've got this solution for your problem. This will feel good, or this will at least take care of your problem that you're dealing with. This is a shortcut. It's quick. It's easy. Sin will take us further than we want to go, cost us way more than we wanted to spend, and keep us far longer than we wanted to go or stay. Uh, that's just the nature of it. It corrupts, it destroys. 2 Corinthians 12, 21 also speaks of that. But I would like to finish reading from Galatians 5, 19 through 24. Galatians 5, 19 through 24. Now this is part of the passage. Uh, as you read on, uh, where Paul is contrasting the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 19 through 24. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and this is not a, uh, a list that includes everything, but it does, it does depict a lot of things that are the works of the flesh, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I told you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, Paul's strong warning that, that if we make a practice of those things, we will not inherit God's kingdom. And then he goes on to contrast in verses uh, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, big contrast, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. There is no human law against those things. There is no heavenly law against those things. And the fruit of the Spirit is that God wants those things to operate in our lives. And the fruit is so much better <clears throat> than the fruit that we get from fallen after the works of the flesh. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your word that, that points out to you, so that points out to us so clearly the way that you want us to walk. And, and so often we, we want to know specifically the way you want, to want, want us to walk. And most of the time you give us general guidance things that you want us to follow after things that you want us to stay away from but if we are faithful to follow those things that general guidance that you will take us to the place you want to take us and use us in the way that you want to use us we ask that you would strengthen us that you would soften our hearts to hear you and lead us in your ways in jesus name amen and thank you very much. God bless you.